Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm not as tall as Ben. And ben, I want to thank you for a nice fine introduction and the very forthright statements you made. And I guess it's true, but I do think that we've been pretty close together on most of the things except uh, one or two. I guess so up to date, we've cast something like four to five hundred votes in the United States Congress. Uh, so it's understandable enough once in a while you don't agree every time on four or five hundred votes, I'm sure. I think uh, when I learned the other day someone asked me about a resolution, a bill, I was a little curious and uh, because I hadn't heard of that one, and I got to checking, and we had something like 12,000 bills introduced so far. Uh, uh, it's, it's quite a place down there in Washington. Well, first let me say, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here. And Ben, I want to thank you for making it possible for me to be here this morning. Originally, I was asked to come in the afternoon. I'm still kind of like a little kid going to the first grade. You, hate, you like to be present in class and school. It's kind of important, too, because they do print your voting record and your attendance record, and I think people expect you to be at your seat in Congress most of the time, uh, and so if I had I stayed over, it probably would have meant missing a second day. This way I'll be back in Washington tonight by leaving here right away, and I'll be ready for Tuesday. I, I guess Monday. I hope it isn't a big day today. I did learn that Colonel Leo Thorsness and Specialist Fourth Class uh, Fitz Morris, both South Dakotans, are today in uh, uh, Washington and they're going to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor at the White House. And they asked that I be there and I said I had a very important engagement out in South Dakota, but I'm sure there will be South Dakotans present for this great award. You know it's the highest award that anyone can receive in wartime. And I may be wrong, but I believe it's the first war, uh, one of these winners we've had since Joe Foss. Maybe I'll have to back up on that statement, but I think it's wonderful that we have two from South Dakota. I've learned very little about Mr. Fitzmorris. I think he spends most of his time out of the state, but he does call South Dakota his home. As a matter of fact, very close at Cavora. And so I do appreciate the chance of having this special time on your program this morning that makes it possible for me to be, to be here today. I think, uh, Ben, as we were saying a moment ago, I made the statement when I went down to Washington I wasn't going to be a rubber stamp for the administration, and I think I have proven that on a number of occasions. If you think I'm in great graces with the White House, you're mistaken it many times. And I feel, I said, I try to look at these bills as to how they affect my people of the 2nd District and, yes, South Dakota, and I've uh, on many occasions have had to disagree with the President. And I'll continue to do so as we go, go along here. Uh, but, uh, I understand, I think the Senate has adopted the Appropriations uh, Conference, Committee report, uh, Conference Committee report on agricultural appropriations. I heard a wild rumor that uh, the President might veto it because there are parts in the bill he doesn't like. I can't believe this, and I don't think it's true. But if it does, I assure you, I and the President will again have a, a strong disagreement. And so I do take these bills one at a time. i just like to say one thing. You've got to admit I picked a great time to go to Washington. There's no two ways about that. I guess history's being written uh, in many ways down there, and, and there's never been a dull moment. We've been besieged with problems from the very time I got there. I remember it uh, wasn't long after I was there, we started impoundments up, and then AIM struck South Dakota. Uh, then we went into uh, oh, one the crisis after the other. And, and uh, so I found it very exciting and, 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 and really uh, hard working, if I can use those words. Now, I've made some observations, I guess, in my nine and a half months down in Pierre, Washington so far. I, knew, I guess I knew it before, but I really know it now that government is a gigantic and a powerful organization that seems to creep and affect everyone's lives. And, of course, it's a very necessary thing, we know, but sometimes you, when you're trying to work on a problem and you're getting the runaround from one bureaucracy to another and what you're trying to fight goes right on and happening to you, you begin to really think it's an uncontrollable monster at times. But I guess that's because government has become so, it could become so great. But it is something that 
It's a constant wrestle to try to stay up with. Uh, it's, it's just so big. I'll say this. People come up and will say, thank you for helping us with this problem or that problem. Well, I, when you really are no stronger a congressman or no better a congressman than the kind of people you have working for you because it's actually impossible to try to, for me personally, to try to keep up with all the problems that we're asked to do. You have people who become experts in their particular field on, on your staff, in Social Security, and veterans, and retirement programs, and you name it, Indian problems, anything. And when you get a letter, you look it over and you assign it to that person, and they, they usually take care of it. If they get a run into a snag, it helps sometimes to have a congressman to call up, and you can get a little tougher with that guy, that bureaucrat, than one of your help kin, and you can help move, move and get things moving sometimes. But as I say, it is uh, uh, impossible when you go in committee meetings at 9, 9.30 in the morning, you start session at 12, you run at least till the evening and sometimes into the night, you have receptions, you have people you have to meet with, you just wouldn't have time to be a one-man gang down there and personally grab everything and personally see that everything is taken care of, that you do it yourself. So you do have to have the kind of people that are willing to work, and I'm very proud of my staff. I have only one person on my entire staff that isn't from South Dakota. Uh, and these people know my people, and they know the district, and I think that's very helpful. That's from Washington right down to our field offices. Now, another observation I made besides government being big, I have little stars in my eyes, I'm sure, when you get down to Washington and you start seeing these people that you've been reading about all your life. But, but the funny part about it, when you really get to, to know them, you find out that people are people wherever you go. Just because they've got a name that you've heard about for years, they're really, really very ordinary people and really very understanding. And, I, and I've just been amazed at how common people are, whether it's in Washington or back, back here in South Dakota. And I might say that uh, I think a majority, I know this is a strong statement to make in this day and age, I guess, but I think that a strong, Majority, as far as I know, more, all of them in Congress are honest, dedicated people who are working hard down there. We have a lot of differences. We have differences in political parties. And let me tell you something, you have a lot of differences within your political parties. So, but this is the way it should be. Everyone comes down to represent the people from their area. You get together, you hammer out problems, but you give and take a little. And when you get through, you have something that's acceptable for the United States in this country. And I think that's the thing that's made uh, Congress what it is and our system of government what it is. I'm almost afraid to make that statement anymore with the way events have been going here, here lately. But I do think that I know the image of a politician as of now isn't what it ought to be with the average citizens around the country. But I still say I've met a lot of wonderful, fine people who I know are very dedicated, dedicated government servants and certainly a bad spa uh, uh, incident can make us all look bad. But they say down in Washington is where the action is, and I guess I'm going to have to agree with that. And as I said a moment ago, it's been nothing but one crisis after the other. And then just this past couple weeks, uh, we've had the Agnew situation come up, the Mideast War, picking up a new vice president. It's just amazing. One day I was walking out of the House chamber, and I got down to the door out of the Capitol, and I couldn't get through. The cameramen were all over, the press guys were there, and I finally turned to a cop and I said, what, what's the problem, you know? You, you can't even get out of here. He said, well, Agnew's here. Well, I didn't know what that was all about until a few minutes later I learned that Agnew was delivering his famous message, a letter to Carl Albert. And same day, this was the day the labor union guy had taken uh, some, uh, this Boyle, I think his name, and tried to poison himself because he's up for murder. Uh, Washington's a place where go, everything goes on at one time, I guess. It's almost hard to keep up. I have to go home. I make sure I read the paper so just to make sure that I haven't skipped anything that might have happened during the day, even though I'm there. But hours are long. Uh, with a certain amount of your pressures you work under, and I've looked out of my ninth floor story apartment, which is only three and a half miles away, and I can't sometimes see the capital for the pollution. With all those things, I want you to know I do like my job very much. It's a pleasure, I consider it a real honor and a privilege to, to, be, to have this opportunity to be your congressman from the 2nd District in Washington. And I don't think I've ever felt the responsibility of an office as much as I do at this time, knowing the situation and the image that we have, knowing the fact that, uh, that uh, South Dakota needs the kind of representation that will bring South Dakota ahead. 
and I, I've been very much aware of it, and I do want you to know I have no complaints. <laughs> I like Washington well enough, I like to be around there a while, no joking aside. But I was wondering about ta talking today, uh, I know we, you're going to hear a lot about agriculture, I just want to briefly talk about a few things like the Agnew situation. I, I, I think uh, all of Congress, this came as a real surprise too, I, at least I didn't have any anticipation he was res uh, knowledge ahead of time that it was re he was resigning that day. I think certainly it was in the best interest of this nation, and it wouldn't have served this nation to have this matter go on and be prolonged. So I was glad to see the resignation and see us get down to the business of running government again. I think it's spared this nation, as I said, a long, prolonged agony that would have uh, followed had this thing gotten into a long, drawn-out trial. But I also, I'd like to point this out. I think the very fact that a vice president could be brought down in the courts ought to make us all really grateful for the kind of system we live under. I mean, that ought to have some real meaning to us. It means that this country still, uh, after uh, is able to correct their problems and go on ahead. But of course, it had a resounding effect. People start wondering, has it ever happened before? Had a vice president ever resigned before? Well, there was a case, and maybe many of you are aware of it. Senator uh, Vice President Calhoun, back in the days of the Jackson days, he resigned, but far for a far different reason. He felt his hands was tied. He was a great believer in state rights. He, uh, he, uh, he uh, was in disagreement with pre the president, so he resigned, ran, went home, ran for the Senate, and spent the rest of his career as a senator. But in history, this was the only other time that this sort of situation had happened. So we were on a whole new uh, incident. Also, this is the first time, and it hasn't been too many years, that we have been able to do what we're doing right now, to pick another vice president. That had come about eight years ago when they adopted the 25th Amendment of the, in the Constitution, of telling us how to nominate a vice president when there's a vacancy. And that's what we're doing at this time. Last <clears throat> Thursday, after the shock wore off the night before, I, we had a meeting, a conference meeting, we call it, it's, the, it's nothing but your party caucus, and we're instructed to submit three names for who we, think, who we thought would make a good vice president. And they asked us to give consideration to someone who had presidential material, someone who was close and intimately close to foreign policy, and above all, someone that Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate would, would accept. Well, I gave this a lot of thought, three names, and I had a list of names and I started crossing off. And when I got through, I ended up with only one name, and I submitted it, and it was Jerry Ford. Now, I have a lot of respect for this man because I've been working with him for nine and a half months. Again, I'm almost holding my breath when I say I know he's intimately qualified and honest as the day is long. And the Lord knows I hope he is, and I have every reason to think he is. It's just that I've been fooled before, and so maybe we all keep tongue in cheek. But the guy is a great guy. He's a very common fellow. Who, who is very attentive to your questions and your answers and advice. He's very close to government and the White House, which is necessary. Whether you like Mr. Nixon or not, he's president, and this man has to work with him. He's because of the fact that he has been the minority leader of the House. He has sat in on the cabinet meetings and the runnings of government at the White House. So he's qualified in that respect, and he does know the foreign policy. And lastly, I know that Democrats and Republicans alike have a great deal of respect for Jerry Ford. And if you were watching television the night the announcement was made, you would have seen Tip O'Neill and the other leaders of the Democratic Party, who I thought were most enthousi enthusiastic when they stood up and applauded for Jerry Ford, because everything I've been reading on it since I've been home has been a very positive response that they do think Jerry Ford's the one man that can help bring this thing back together again. I know, again, on differences, Republicans and, and the Democrats. Of course, uh, there has been great differences between Mr. O'Neill and Mr. Ford on issues. But let me tell you, I think Mr. O'Neill would be the first one to tell you that he respects Mr. Ford, he's honest, and, and states the case as he sees it. So I really believe that it isn't going to be too long before this is approved. I know there's going to be a very, very thorough check, but by the end of this month, hopefully we are going to have a new vice president in many ways, I hate to see him leave the House because I don't know of a guy on our side right now, and I've got a lot to learn yet, but I don't know one fellow who can bring, like I said a moment ago, 
we have our problems within our groups. We have the liberals versus the conservatives and the moderates. And I, every one of these people I know that I know of to a man think Jerry Ford's the one guy that can do it, put everything together on our side. Both sides have respect for him, and I think that's and within our, our own group, and that's what I felt so strongly about this man. So hopefully this thing will come to pass and will be approved. I'm not going to touch much on Watergate except to say what I said back in the campaign. I still believe that who's ever been is the guilty ones, the culprits ought to be brought out and, and punished. I think sometimes that if we had turned the whole situation over to Mr. Cox, who was picked by and confirmed by Republicans and Democrats alike in the Senate to handle this job and had the show on the road, we'd be better off. I hope the president relinquishes those tapes. I know the judge the other day said, recommended that he they told him to turn them over to, to the judge, but now it's going to the Supreme Court. But the sooner we get those tapes out and going, the better off we're going to be. Now, let me just say, like, like I said, I could talk quite a while about agriculture, but I know agriculture is going to be your subject for a long time. As Ben said, I am a farmer, I am close to it, I am well aware of the needs. I want you to realize that. But I would like to touch on a few other things, and uh, maybe I'm going to be a little slow getting into agriculture here. And one of these things that bother me is the budgetary problems and the conditions we've been working under down in Washington. This has to be, I think, one of my greatest disappointments because, as Ben said, I was on the Appropriations Committee and chairman of that committee for 10 years here in South Dakota. And I just wish we had the same kind of an efficient organization and committee group that we have back in South Dakota. Here in our own state, we have a budget, our own budget specialist in our state legislature. And we do have something to offer in the way of budgets. But in Washington, apparently all these years, there's never been anything but the budgetary uh, program coming out of the White House in the Office of Management and Budget. Now, a lot of us, not me, who belong, people who've been there for a long time know that this has to change because our country, we get together in appropriations and start passing bills right and left, and really no one keeps a very good control of where we're going or how much can we spend. In state government, we establish a priority, a, a priority list of expenditures. We put in a ceiling. That ceiling has to be because we have a constitutional provision that says you can't spend more than you take in. Well, down in Washington, we don't have that. The third biggest item in the budget is your interest on your indebtedness. The third biggest item in this $268 billion budget. And sometimes, somewhere, things like this, we're going to have to get a hold of it. Because if there is one big problem domestically in this country at this moment, it's the runaway inflation. And I'll contend for quite a while that Congress themselves in Washington and the Hill, all of us have to, to take our share of blame for the kind of inflation that's going on right now today. You just can't go on spending and spending and spending more than you're taking in. Fine, if we want the programs and we think everyone's necessary, maybe we better look at some ways to start raising the revenue to have it, or at least to make up our mind we're going to live within a budget. Now, because of this, there's been a special committee in the House and the Senate that's made a study and has looked into this. And they come forth with a budgetary procedure bill. Earlier, I'd put my name on a bill that I liked, that I looked at, and which called for, for about the same thing that this budgetary procedure bill does. This would establish a budget ceiling about how much do you think you're going to take in that you can spend. Then it would set up some kind of a flexible priorities on how the money ought to be spent. It wouldn't tie you down completely by any means on the flexible priority order. That can change. And it should change to the majority of what the people want in Congress because they're the representatives of the people. I mean, just can't have everything just the way I want it any more than the guy from New York can. But it's a meeting of the minds. But the major point is this. If you're going to exceed the budget, then you're going to have to do something to provide the revenues. If you're going to expand one program over another, then you've got to cut back in another area of the budget. This is what you call fiscal responsibility and living within your means. And I'm happy to say that I read in the paper the other day now that the Senate has come has kind of compromised on the original budgetary procedure bill they weren't too happy with, but uh, now they're talking about getting together on, on a bill that they can work with, and the House is doing so likewise now. And I hope that at least in this 93rd session of Congress, I know it'll never go into effect this year, it's far too long gone, or too late, but by the time another year comes around, that we do have some guidelines, that we do have some priorities, and we do have some limitations. I'm not suggesting I know how they should come out, 
but I am saying they should be discussed, debated on the floor of the House, but when we're all through, the final figure we come up with has got to be something that we have somewhere in the neighborhood of the money coming in. Because I point out again this year, both sides are guilty of this. Mr. Nixon presented a budget to us of $268 billion, which in the very beginning we were told was going to be something like $12 billion in the red. You can't go on now, we're heaping more onto it all the time. I've heard it said that one side says, well, we're cutting back, it's he that's adding. Let me tell you something about this budget. 72% of that budget, almost 75 now, no one can really c even touch. It's building costs like pensions, retirements, and you name it, that's got to go each time. Trust funds, and we don't even have anything really to say about it. And the things that we do today are not going to show up as big expenditures in the very beginning this year. By the end of the second and the third year, though, you can bet your bottom dollars it's going to take billions of dollars to carry those programs through, and there's literally, literally nothing you can do about it because it's been built into law. I saw this happen just the other day. Two bills came up on retirements and group insurance. You know, I think federal government employees probably have one of the greatest uh, overall group of fringe benefits that any, any organization or, or industry or anyone else has ever had to offer. It's a good system. We have an excellent medical program, uh, medical care, group insurance. But the federal employees have to pay 60% of it. The federal pay, uh, government pays 40. Now, they tell us in, uh, some industries paying 100. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You can ask my people who are on my payroll in Washington and here who've been ill. They'll tell you it's one of the finest policies you can ever have for the money, for the money they pay. But the other day, we put in a bill, and it went sailing. It says that the first year we're going to start contributing 50% of the cost of that in policy, and then we're going to go crap to 75%. Maybe this year it isn't going to cost that much, but by the time that figure reads 75 billion, 75% uh, of the cost, we're talking about billions of dollars that's been built into the policy or into the budget that I or no one else really has any part of after that. It's, it's an automatic situation. And this is the kind of thing I think we gotta, uh, we're talking about when I say we've got to be very careful and start giving some fiscal responsibility to this. Now another item I want to touch on because it's really important to all of us, and that's this energy situation. I happen to serve on, on uh, two major committees down in Washington. One of them is the Public Works Committee, and the other one is the Veterans Committee. Well, you know, the, vet uh, the Public Works Committee is, has a number of subcommittees, and one of my subcommittees is the Energy Committee. I'm also on a special Republican Task Force Committee on Energy. So I've been getting into this subject for quite some time. And at the very outset, I know it has been very obvious that, that we are in a crisis on energy. Now, I'm not suggesting someone isn't wrong or why it happened, but I am telling you there just isn't an, enough oil and gas to do the job we want to do today. And we have to give it, it certainly has to be right up there as one of our number one priorities and, and one of what we're up against. All the way around, this ex the extra fuel that we're using is, is getting more difficult to find. Now we got the Mideast war situation going on, which makes it doubly tough for this nation. It makes a real crisis for us because this is one of the touchiest subjects we could ever get into in this Mideast situation. We could be in the thing tomorrow, and I'm afraid it'd make Vietnam look like child play if we ever do. You'd have the two big powers at each other in Russia and America. And I don't know, if we ever had to handle something with kid gloves, it's this very situation that we're running into today. Now, they think, of course, the Arab states feel that they can bring America maybe to their knees because of their great need for their oil and their gas. They certainly can make it very difficult and make people in this country very uncomfortable because we are reliant to too large an extent, I guess as far as I'm concerned, but this the way we have to go for their oil and gas because we're not producing all that we need in this country and, and, and the demand is getting to be for more and more. So we have to, this is a, a, a serious situation. Before I came home, I was briefed, went to a briefing that someone set up on the Mideast situation, Joseph Sisko, the Assistant Secretary of State in charge of the Middle East, gave us an hour briefing, and things I learned there from him, I come home and find it not, must not be that way now because I read the headlines where we're sending planes and equipment over to uh, 
uh, Israel. And I guess Russia now, they're coming out saying has been pumping it in uh, since the war started into Egypt and to Syria. So here we are in a, in a real crisis that's very explosive that could blow up, not only get us into a war, but if we can avoid that, it could certainly be uh, a, a strong effect on the cultural living standards we have in this country. Because let me tell you something, this, this crisis thing isn't going to go away overnight. It would be wonderful if we had all the answers and, and had our new forms of producing energy available and going. But we don't have. And because of this, we're going to have to, one of the major answers to the immediate future is bringing in more imports of oil all the time. And 80 percent of the known reserves in this world is over in the Persian Gulf. And that's where, of course, everyone's going to. And it's not only America that needs that oil any longer. You're competing with Japan and Europe and all the other countries. And, and so this is what makes it so, so uh, such a crisis and such a, a dangerous situation is what might be happening. I know every day I wake up and I wonder what has happened on this situation now. And of course, uh, the amount of oil and gas in this country that we use, people said, how come? How come all at once there's no energy around, no oil and gas? Well, that's a good question. I won't be the first to admit, and I'd like to know, except this. I do know that there are those who've been trying to tell us up in Washington and on the Hill and in the, in the Capitol for a number of years that this thing is coming. I'm listening a little more now when they start telling us a water crisis is not too many years away in this country for all over all the United States, because these things have a habit of creeping up on you. And we've been told that this situation is coming. But the time, each year goes by, we're using more and more and more uh, of fuel and energy. Do you realize that, or not to, for instance, today, the demand for energy, uh, how fast it's been growing? Total energy consumption, including the use to generate electricity, rose from the equivalent of 21 million barrels of crude oil a day in 1960 to the equivalent of over 33 million barrels a day in 1972. Oil and gas now provide over three-quarters of the United States energy. We've come a long ways. In one of our hearings, I know I asked a gentleman from a petroleum company, admittedly. He was talking about the number of industries in the last few years that have converted from coal over to gas and oil. And he had charts to show it with government figures. It just went right up a huge jump. And this is, again, because of the government and our EPA standards. Environmental Protection uh, Agency has adopted uh, st certain standards, and pollution is a major concern. So many of them said, why fight it? We've been burning coal. We're getting in trouble. Let's switch to gas, and let's switch to diesel. And because of this, uh, this is where the really one large part of the fuel has been going. And then you look at another area. Uh, in, in the automobile business, does any of you happen to have a 73 car? I'll tell you something. If you want to see where gasoline goes, drive one of those away. With all the emission control that's been made to be put on. Well, you know, you look at this whole thing and it's kind of a two-sorted situation. On the one side, we're told we've got to clean up the air and we have this emission controls on cars as one thing. It's using a lot more gas as we get more sophisticated and have more time nationwide, people take longer trips. We're using gas, considerably more gas, every day. And then on the other end, we have these environmental uh, standards. We know we have offshore oil, oil drilling that could go on. But we're concerned about it because they had an uh, oil spill a few years ago over the, off the Santa Barbara uh, shores. So that's been stopped around the United States. We've got lots of coal, the big thing that we have in this country. But again, that too, is because of the pollutant of it and the sulfur, has been stopped. We know that one kind of uh, diesel, diesel oil, diesel that we can get is the lower grades. That is prohibited to burn. Uh, we can't burn. So you see, we're working at it. It's a very difficult situation when you're trying to clean up the environment to have uh, and uh, all these other things go on. But the extra gallons and the barrels it takes, there's only one answer to it for a while, as I said a moment ago, and that is to continue exporting. And many people feel that even without this Mideast war, we're going to have a difficult time bringing in the amount of fuel we're going to need. So then we talk about allotments. Uh, let's have fuel allocations. And I gave this a lot of thought, and I guess it had to come. But I want to tell you something. It isn't going to make for one gallon extra oil or any more gas for you. All it's going to do is change the distribution of it. And frankly, 
as bad as it's been in South Dakota, it's a heck of a lot worse than those other states around us. And this is the very thing that disturbs me, because every other state thinks they're going to benefit by this mandatory allocation. So let me tell you something. Someone's going to benefit and someone's going to get hurt. And I'm just wondering where South Dakota is going to lie in this. But I guess this is had to come. This is the answer. But it isn't, I tell you, isn't going to make for any more extra gallons. It is establishing priorities. We've seen the propane situation. I try to keep abreast of it. It's, it's difficult right now. It's going to get worse as we start drying crops. But one thing under propane, agriculture has top priority along with hospitals and several other places. Just this last week since I've come home, they've announced the program for rationing Disla. It's different. It's not quite the same program because they're catching all kinds of trouble over natural gas and propane. Already companies are saying they're going to have to close down where they use so much of it. And in the, this, this kind of a suit I wear, this polyester. They use all kinds of natural gas in that and they can't get it so they're talking as much as 250,000 people being laid off on the East Coast when this shortage comes in. So the heat's on the government there. So this time in Dislet they said in rationing, in this situation, all they're asking is that we stick to allotments and uh, from what they had last year and they leave, uh, leave it up to the states to, to make some determination. They hold back 10% for emergency uses, so right away 10% we're going to have less than maybe we had before. What I'm trying to say is energy is a, is a real crisis and it's going to be with us for a long time. And of course, agriculture, we can't do too much about it. I, I mean. We are one of the big users, not really, 3%. If we put it down to farming, we use 3% of all the petroleum used in the United States, but it is a large amount. But now we're talking about one of the answers to this program is to start conserving. I was amazed to learn that a third of all the national, natural gas I use in my apartment stove is used to those pilot lights. Uh, many other things like this that we could do to be conserving. But in agriculture, where we are large users, there's not one area really that we can conserve in that I know of. When that tractor has to run, it has to run. When you've got to dry crops, you've got to dry crops. It, it isn't like the traveler that can cut out a trip. Well, I see my time is running out, and then I didn't know where I was going to stop and go, and I've just been rambling and rambling on here. I wanted to talk about some other things, but you do have a tight schedule. And uh, these are some of the things, though, I think we're talking about inflation, budgetary problem, crises. I think these are. Uh, the energy crisis are certainly three of the most important uh, items that we have in Washington to deal with. I'm equally concerned about things in agriculture and, and, uh, uh, and other acts that we have coming up. I'd like to have been able to talk about the War Powers Bill today and several other matters, but I just have to let it suffice with saying I shall look forward to having the opportunity to coming back again and trying to get, keep you posted on my feelings and how I think uh, things stand in Washington. I'd like to say this, that I have four field offices in South Dakota, at Rapid City, at Pier, Huron, and Mitchell. Now, I'm only allowed three by law, so I pay for the fourth one myself, and I can assure you I'm paying for it myself. But I think it's necessary to be a service to the people. I truly believe that 80% of the responsibility job I have anymore is trying to help the people with their problems, and we're finding this out. I keep three full-time field men, and one of them is with me today, Sid Davison, stand up. Where are you, Sid? <laughs> Sid works out of the Huron and Mitchell offices when I let him, but most of the time I try to want him on the road traveling with his third of the district. Al Herman out of Pier, he travels most of the time. We try to, and, and with some time in the office. But he goes around to the counties instead of waiting, making the people come to us. Same way with Gary Drews out of Rapid City. And I want you to know that if any time any of you have any problems, don't hesitate to contact us. You can reach me in Washington, or better yet, you can call any one of my offices, and, there'll be a, and we'll get on with the problem as fast as we can. I can assure you there's a lot of problems we don't have any quick answers for, but I can assure you, I also can assure you, that we'll do our very level best if hard work is any answer for the solution to your problem, I can assure you you'll have it from us. And thank you very kindly for this opportunity to be with you this morning. It has the same problem as we have all over the state. Your elevator marketed 3 million bushels of grain last year and only had, I think, 23 boxcars. That's nothing. And I have written you, and I know you're interested in this. I was just congratulating you when you went out. Oh. For, for being a congressman that stands on your own feet, and that's why you were elected. 
Now, could you tell us something about the Transportation Act of 1973 that provides for $3 billion for the rehabilitation of railroads? And if it passes, will it go to Penn Central in the east? Will South Dakota get a break? Now, what are the prospects? Well, let me say this. If, you, to say, if this you're talking is, about Amtrak, I guess this is what we're, the one we're talking about. It's, uh, uh, this is, we aren't going to get any good out of it out here in South Dakota, I have to admit. Uh, I, I have said just in the congressional record the other day, Emo, I took part in a, a special order on boxcars. I've appeared before the Senate committee and a number on it. But I made this statement. I think the, gov we, the, the government itself is as much the cause of what we've been going through as anyone. This idea of trying to call up four years' crops in one year, it was ridiculous. It put all kind of pressure. Um, they put all kind of pressure on, the, gov on the, the railroads. And I'm not defending them other than this. I was surprised to learn that Milwaukee is just putting a, is finishing up 500 of these huge boxcars. They have been building some. I wish they'd put more money into their tracks, too, while they're at it, because they're in bad shape. But it's a combination. The railroads could have done better, and certainly the federal government hasn't helped it a minute. Can I, you made me think of one thing, Emo. I want to say something I learned when I come home. I'm a farmer. I have some grain in storage. I had to deliver it. I made the grade. Jack McBriar, my elevator man at Kennebec, got a hold of me and told me what was happening. You got to get this in within, what is it, 60 days after you redeem it and sell it, or you lose your overrun on, grain, on the excess bushels that you have in storage. Instead of collecting all those years of storage for those extra bushels you had that they deliberately reduced when you take a loan, you'd lose it. Well, I called Mr. Frick a minute after I got back, and I'm happy to say when I called again the other day, they are extending this time, and as I don't even know if the state committee's heard about it, but if you do happen to have an overrun and if they told you you've lost your credit that you got coming, the, the storage, you know, you may have contracted the elevator for, that, for a price, but they can't take the grain in. So you pay off the, uh, the government and sit around and wait for the elevator to collect it. Three months after you have done it, they tell you you're too late to, catch, uh, to receive payment for the overrun on the storage. Well, we hope this is corrected. Even though I run off and I'm taking I too much time. I just wanted to say, I was told this morning by the ASC office that the deferments are out. And, and we have only been able to uh, deliver one half of our CCC grain. It was unreasonable to expect all these years brought in right now. Right. And we hope maybe that you can change that to extend it. But if the, if the Transportation Act of 1973 comes up for consideration, we hope you will also give that some consideration and see that South Dakota gets a break. We can't afford to lose our railroads. Well, Emo, you just got taken the other day if that bill isn't vetoed in mass transportation. Now we're going to subsidize uh, these big transits in the cities up to the tune of how many? $800 million a year. And I can't see how that's going to benefit South Dakota either, but I guess these are problems we've got to work out. I, I really don't know, but that was the Act of 72, and now it's the Act of 73, and we hope you fellows can get some action on that. Save the railroads. Thank Save you. the railroads. Thanks again, Jim. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ben, Adam, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and want to thank personally Ben and the members of South Dakota Farmers Union for inviting me to be here and share part of your convention. I've greatly enjoyed the program so far. I enjoyed Congressman Abner's remarks, and I wish I could stay through the whole convention program, but unfortunately I and Commissioner Weefald will have to leave shortly after the noon lunch. It's always a treat to work with people like your great state president and Ray Novak and Reuben Johnson and some of the others that you have, and the remainder of your program looks at least as interesting. I was pleased, of course, to again rub shoulders with fellows like George Levine and Frank Butler and Leif Lender and a number of them that I work with on different boards of directors and on a continuing farmers union type of activity. And farm, or, uh, South Dakota looks pretty darn good with the kind of weather you got. I just might sneak back here sometime during the pheasant season. But really, I want to bring you greetings on behalf of your neighbors across the state line, Minnesota Farmers Union, and to wish you the very best in your convention in the year ahead. And then I have just a couple of remarks that I think express the feeling that we have and that 
I particularly experienced in watching your young farmers last night. I was really impressed with the number of young people and the positive attitude that they have, and I think that's important. It's great to be a part of a team that is progressive, that's looking ahead, that really is far out in front. And especially when you look to the opportunities and the challenges that face us in Farmers Union. It's a very bright opportunity and a very large challenge that we face. We're told every day that agriculture is a whole new ball game now. And that's true. That's true not just because some people are saying it or because there have been some rather severe changes, but it's true because there are a number of forces that will now have severe influence on agriculture that we've never experienced before, certainly to that degree. The new and increasingly recognized world demand for food and the ability to get it to some of the areas of need. Food as a major involvement in international trade and with it international policy. Food, your production in determining international monetary policy. $13 billion of your products went in international trade last year. And from here on in, you will never again be left out of the consideration of international trade. Agriculture won't. Farming is going to be increasingly involved in environment, land use, ecology, and a number of things that really haven't been that much involvement for you in the past. And looking at these and looking at the opportunity that they afford if we have the right kind of direction, very frankly, I'm extremely excited and interested. And I can hardly wait for some of the changes that are going to take place and that Farmers Union can continue to be out in front and give the kind of direction it has in the past because now you'll have the opportunity to implement some of the leadership thinking that you've displayed in the past and it's been overlooked. But in this new ball game, you can't have the same old regulations and the same old referees and the same old game plan, or you won't have the same players around. In the new ball game, you're going to have to have some farmer regulations and some farmer thinking. And that's why we're calling on you people to look to this convention and your activities in the year ahead to provide some new direction. Because we can't afford any more of the massive mistakes that have been made for agriculture in the past, and particularly in the past few years. We can't afford, we as farmers, the consumers, this nation can't afford any more Russian wheat sales, regardless of how, where you pinpoint the blame. This nation simply can't afford that kind of massive blunder. We can't afford any more of the development of fuel shortage. When 10 years ago, written reports were saying that would catch up to us in 1973 or 1974, and those giving direction for agricultural policy sat idly by and allowed it to happen, knowing that it would happen because of the profit involved. And agriculture, and only agriculture, was subjected to the black market resulting from it. And now the same thing is developing in fertilizer and in other agricultural decisions that are made off the farm. And I'm saying to you that we cannot allow these things to continue to happen, even though they may be off-farm decisions in agriculture, the results come home to you. Some of the mistakes made in the meat and livestock situation are appalling when you look at them. And I'm sorry to say these mistakes are continuing, and they're continuing because of the same motivation. The Farm Bill is a good ex example. The Farm Bill in concept is a giant step forward in the right direction, in principle. But it really is an illustration of the lack of appreciation for agriculture and the lack of understanding when somebody else makes the directions and gives the decisions for you. With the present level of target prices and frozen for two years, this could spell disaster if your costs continue to go up at 12% per year and no adjustment is made. That doesn't mean that that farm bill isn't good. It means that it needs correction and farmer application of the kind of direction and level of application that it'll have to have. We've got to have a food reserve. A simple food reserve would have avoided the soybean scandal. 
and the deterioration of our export market that resulted from it. We've got to have a world food plan when as much as 80% of some of our products go for overseas world food consideration. And it's about time this administration or the government for this nation stopped torpedoing and dragging its feet for world food planning and international grains agreements and gave some leadership instead. And we're going to have to insist that that's the direction farm thinking takes. It's ridiculous to think that you can run an industry like agriculture and an involvement in international affairs and a food situation for people around the world and not plan in advance and apply those plans to those of you in agriculture. Today, instead of moving ahead and planning on a systematic basis, farmers and consumers alike are confused and frustrated. Livestock farming is a good example. At a time when we really ought to be expanding our meat production as rapidly as possible, farmers are very reluctant, and I don't blame them. They lost $200 per head in that $20 drop on fed cattle. And when they have to pay 10-12% interest on money, and they don't know what the food, cheap food policy of this nation will result, I don't blame them for a go slow attitude. And the consumers are frightened. When I talk to the consumers that are protesting, they're not protesting against farmers. They're protesting against a stumbling, blundering attitude of those who've been giving misdirection for agriculture, and frankly, I don't blame them. It's about time somebody protested. Anytime this nation experiences food shortage, even temporarily, in the face of what you as farmers can and would like to do, it's about time somebody protested and protested publicly. The only thing is there ought to be a better understanding and better direction of what that protest is leveled against. The consumers of this nation have a right to expect food abundance. And you as farmers have the right to expect parity for the production of that food abundance. And when we work together and understand the common problem, instead of somebody else making the decisions for us, we can go forward together toward that kind of an objective and goal. We looked at the daily paper of the last couple of days and if you want an illustration of the lack of really understanding of farmers level agriculture, read the Omaha paper today or the New York paper of a couple of days ago. It's a credit to your local paper, the editorial attitude toward your convention here, that they do have an appreciation for the importance of agriculture. But we have a responsibility to do more than criticize and recognize the problem. We have a responsibility to lead in our own best interests as well as the interest of our industry and our nation. And that's you and I as individuals as well as the Farmers Union organization. Farmers Union has been in the lead for years and I'd like to have Farmers Union move right out in front now, way out in front, in recognizing the opportunity and presenting a progressive attitude like you have in the past. And a rural economy can light up just like the countryside lit up with REA when you showed that same kind of leadership and the understanding that this thing could be done if it just had some farmer thinking and some farmer application. The record's clear, and it's a good record, both for farmers and farmers union. You don't have to ask anybody what farm production amounts to in this nation or around the world. And if anybody takes a look, and increasingly they're doing so, you don't have to ask about farmers' union record. You can look now at the Brennan Plan, which is the basis for the new farm program. You can look at our thinking on the need for a food reserve here and around the world. The recognition for family farming agriculture. Some long range look for land use. All of these, farmers' union has been out in front and we've got to move further out in front. And for those that still cling to the old idea of supply and demand, if they ever need a glaring illustration, they had it in that last soybean scandal, when neither the supply nor the demand changed from the time that soybeans went from $4 a bushel to $12 a bushel. It's just that the profiteer had more of an influence. The world demand didn't change in that time, and your production was all in. Neither supply nor demand changed. But price changed, it tripled. 
and it ought to put to rest for all time that kind of negative, arguing, carping attitude that really deters leadership and planning for the proper utilization of this industry that you have. And the record of South Dakota Farmers Union is equally good. You can look at the long range or you can look at the immediate past under the leadership of men like Ben Radcliffe and Adam Seidel and Leland Swenson and the rest of them. In the past short year, their determination and courage to take the disaster situation to court when they were wronged and abused, their willingness to stand and say no when excess profits were sought by the telephone industry, their willingness to take a stand on governmental reorganization not only meant millions of dollars to you, but it meant a voice where you needed to have a voice. And that's the kind of leadership that you need to stand behind and recognize in providing this kind of direction for the future. But our record of the past, even here, is not good enough. Farming for tomorrow is like defensive driving. They tell us that in defensive driving, it's not enough to know what you're doing with your own vehicle, how you operate that, that it's in good shape, that you're under control and the whole thing, that's your farm. In defensive driving, you've got to know what the other fellow in traffic's going to do, and the pedestrian and the road and all the rest of it that involve you. And that same thing is true in agriculture. Tomorrow you're going to have to find, depending on what the satellite weather forecast is for China and Russia and India, and what international role is played for agriculture in international nego negotiations and the monetary system and ag processing and world food diets and the rest of it. And we're going to have to plan and give direction for that. And in doing this, it's about time that we stand up, each of us individually, and display an honesty that we haven't probably displayed as much as we need to in the past. That honesty is admitting to your own capabilities as well as your own failures, recognizing that you have the capability to give better direction for farming in the future than anybody else. You're the most professional group in agriculture today, and you're going to have to recognize and assume that responsibility. If you don't, somebody else will continue to give the misdirection. Those that are presently giving the direction for agriculture have neither the appreciation or the understanding that's necessary. I visited just recently with a prof professional career army person. He come back from two years of intensive study in international military operations. He came back and visited with me for two reasons. He's a good friend of mine, but more importantly, he said, I couldn't believe it when I'm taking intensive training in a military establishment and they're telling me that the number one consideration is agriculture and food production. And that regardless of our military development, we cannot be number one if we don't continue to maintain number one position in agriculture. And he said six months before the Russian wheat sale, we had army photostats of the disaster drought conditions in Russia. We knew it in the army. It's odd that they didn't know it in agriculture. That's the kind of misdirection when you let somebody else make these decisions for you. You do have a great opportunity, but you do have a sore need to develop this kind of leadership and develop it fast, and a responsibility that will give direction before the decisions are made wrongly. The future is bright, not only for your product, for agriculture in total. We hear continually about the declining number of farmers and no young farmers. Well, you pretty well corrected that last night. And I took a look at our state statistics before I left Minnesota. The number of young farm couples that we have in Minnesota taking GI farm training and adult training, and they're not all taking that training by a long ways. We got 10,000, 10,000 young couples in Minnesota that we can identify as GI trainees and young adult ag trainees. That's the kind of leadership we've got to go and get and stop discouraging them, encourage them, and bring them into Farmers Union. The record of accomplishment in Farmers Union is really a very sound basis to work on. We've got all that we need in the way of organization and understanding. We can build that kind of appreciation. If we follow the leadership of fellows like Ben and Tony Deschamps and Ruben and the rest of them, not because they're your friends, 
not because they're good guys, but more importantly because they're the most capable, and they've demonstrated it, the most capable people to provide this leadership for agriculture that there is in the world today. They deserve that. Now is the time for us to take the initiative, while the public is concerned and receptive, to look to new leadership in recognition of the mistakes those have been giving direction in the past have made. And if we seize on that opportunity and we take this direction, it will de be indeed a very bright day ahead for agriculture. Our success depends largely on four main things that I want to mention to you in closing. One, of course, and I put this at the top of the list, that's personal involvement. Nobody, nobody is going to do that job for you, and you don't want them to. That's the one thing we better understand. Not only is nobody else going to take the lead for agriculture unless you do, but you don't want them to, or you won't get it back. And second is to use the tools that you've got that give you the strength Agriculture is the greatest industry. If you harness that industry, you've got all the strength. Let me give you an illustration. And this is one I'll never forget because it's a true story with me. When I was on the farm back at Sock Center, we were building a hog house. And we had an old German fellow directing the work, and he knew his business. And you better do it right, regardless of whether you own the farm or not, or he'd call you out right now. And I appreciated that, and so did the rest of the crew. And after we worked with him a while, we got ready to cut the rafters, and he said, it's a one to seven slant, you cut the rafters, just like that. <laughs> now, I knew what would happen if they didn't fit at the toe or the heel, and I said, Hank, I don't know how to cut those rafters. And he looked at me completely disgusted. I was standing there with a square in my hand. He said, you've got a square, haven't you? And I said, yes. He said, you don't even know how to use your own tools. He's absolutely right. I bought that square. If I'd known how to use it, I could have cut that rafter. I can use it to make a square line across the board, probably the most meaningless use of that whole tool. That's the way it is with your co-ops. If you're going to use them for some little superficial thing and not really use them effectively, you can't expect to get the benefits from them. You've got to learn to use the tools that you've got. Use them effectively. Use them completely. And then you've got to have the confidence in yourself that you can and will do this. And that reminds me of another story, if you'll permit. I hope Commissioner Weefall listens to this. I see him looking at his watch, but I promised him that I had a story about Norwegian people today. He's been giving you Swedes a bad time. And this is a story about the people in a lumber camp a crew that worked together just had a wonderful relationship. They worked together all week long, but every Saturday night when they went into town, Big Ole, and Big Ole was the hardest worker and the best guy in the crew, but every Saturday night Big Ole went into town and he got a couple of beers under his belt and then he wanted to fight. And he could fight and he'd licked everybody in the crew at least three or four times and it wasn't any fun anymore. But they didn't like to throw him out because he was such a good guy. So one of the fellows got an idea and he said, listen, I'm going to teach Ole a lesson. We're going into town Saturday night. There's a circus coming into town. They got a trained gorilla. I'm going to rent that gorilla. And I'm going to put him in that dark room at the back end of the bar. And Ole's going to learn his lesson. So it worked just like clockwork. They went into town Saturday night. The circus came in. The fellow rented the gorilla. And he put him in the dark room. And then he sidled up to Ole. And he said, Ole, now I know you can handle me. You've showed me that. But I got a friend that came into town today, and he kind of likes to fight. And if you weren't afraid of him, he'd kind of like to take you on. Well, Big Ole could hardly wait. So they took him back to the back room and opened the door and shoved him in and slammed the door. And for about five minutes, the walls shook and the windows rattled and the floor heaved. And then it came to a complete calm. And the door opened and out stepped Ole. And he dusted off his hands and he walked over to the bar and he said, it happens every damn time. You find one of these Norwegians with hair on his chest and he thinks he's tough. <laughs> now the last, the last story, and, and this is also a true incident, is in attitude, probably more than anything else. 
We've got to have the right attitude toward your personal involvement in your organization. When I lived up in northwestern Minnesota, I had a very dear friend by the name of Walt Turgeon. And Big Walt loved his community. He'd grown up in it. He was a strong farmers union member, but he was a good practical joker. He was always kidding with his friends, and he had many of them. But what he believed in, he really believed in. And one day he went into town, he was going to try and trade cars with a lifelong friend of his who was in the automobile dealership. And as they walked around Walt's car looking at it, Walt was telling the dealer everything that was good about it. Didn't use any oil and very little gas and the tires were like new and everything else. And the dealer was telling Walt everything that was wrong with it. You could see that the front end was out of line and the windshield was cracked and the paint was chipped. And they got around to the back end of the car and this is true. And on the trunk lid, there was a Farmers Union sticker, that little red sticker. And the dealer said, now you see that sticker on there, if I, I gotta take that off. That'll leave a mark on the paint and I'll have to dock you for that. Just like that, the fun stopped. And Walt said, listen, for what that sticker means to me, I'll paint that whole damn car. And for what it's done for me, I can well afford to do it. Find this fun, but don't knock my organization. Now they went ahead and traded cars, and it didn't interfere with their friendship. But it didn't leave any doubt about what Walt's attitude was toward his organization. And that's the kind of attitude that you've got to have. And it won't leave any doubt in anybody's mind about the bright future we have for us. Thank you very much.